Today on Inside Utah Politics, the Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control rolling out a new multi-year strategic plan. The director is here to explain what it's all about. Plus, congressional Republicans say the president is to blame for a troubled economy, and they're rolling out their own plan. The president says is even worse. We have reaction from both sides. Time now for Inside Utah Politics. Thanks for joining us. I'm Glenn Mills. It is time to go inside Utah politics. We do begin this morning with Tiffany Clayson. She is the director of the Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control here to discuss a new multi-year strategic plan. Tiffany, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, Glenn, thanks for having me. Look, I am so excited to talk about our multi-year strategic plan. All right, a lot to get into, so let's uh, jump right into it. First off, let's talk about uh, a summary of the plan. What's it all about? Great. Look, this plan is our first ever multi-year strategic plan. And what's really exciting about that is um, the fact that we are a half a billion dollar public enterprise. And as such, we have to have a roadmap to not only guide our operational decision making, but to hold ourselves accountable and so that our customers can hold, you know, hold us accountable as well. Um, in order to do that, we have to have a plan and a clearly communicated vision with goals, objectives, and a way to measure ourselves um, in order to make that happen. Um, I think the thing that's exciting not only about having a plan and working to develop a plan is that this plan was not developed in a silo where at the DABC we just made decisions for our customers without our customers. This is an intentional collaborative plan that we built in conjunction with interviews and uh, surveying all of our partners in law enforcement, prevention, education, hospitality, all of those businesses that we serve, and also surveying and talking and interviewing our workforce. So retail, warehouse, and compliance staff. So I'm really excited that one of the goals, number three, um, greater transparency and communication yielded this very product mm -hmm. itself, but also the collaborative um, effort that, that helped build the product. So we're really excited. We will dig into the five goals that are yep. uh, set out in this uh, plan in just a second. But first, talk about how long that took and how did the idea come about? Is that something you came up with? It did. Really, when, when I got to the agency um, about you know, 15 plus months ago, it, was, it, it became clear that there was not a published strategic plan. So we created a, a quick one-year strategic plan so that we could make sure we were in alignment and we kind of knew where we were going during this transition period. Right before the holidays, we worked to um, engage a team to help us develop this plan. And they, over the holiday period, into the very beginning parts of, of this calendar year, worked to help us do those surveys, do those interviews. And as you can see, we just were releasing it this week. Mm -hmm. um, and really excited uh, that about a year and a half in, we're able to have this multi-year strategic plan guide us through the next four or so years. Okay, so the plan, as we alluded to, broken up into five goals. Let's yep. go through all of those sure. five goals. You already mentioned one of them. Uh, but the first one, infrastructure advancements. Talk about that. Sure. So infrastructure advancements, um, when I first came to the agency, it was immediately clear that we had a massive IT or tech deficit. We didn't have basic things in 2021 to serve our customers, such as um, uh, an online payment portal. So these businesses that we serve, hotels, restaurants, bars, they have to interact with us in a very paper heavy, clunky way. And they can't pay online or over the phone. So oftentimes we'll have people drive up even from like Moab or Richfield or St. George to deliver an application and a check or money order. That is not acceptable in, in especially 2022. <laughs> we need these businesses that we support to be able to make their application for a permit or a license, pay for those uh, fees in a way that's quick and then let them move back to doing what they do best, right? Investing in their business, employing people, helping people through their restaurants, hotels, et cetera, make memories of a lifetime's weddings, celebrations, et cetera. So uh, we wanna support these businesses by having the proper IT infrastructure mm -hmm. so that they can, can do that efficiently. So we're very excited about that. And let me tell you, I'm very grateful to the governor and to the legislature. They, this last session, made historic commitments of funding and investment into our agency to deliver. And so I'm proud to announce that we now have four different projects that we're deploying when we get that funding in July, and they're gonna help us achieve so many of the goals and objectives in mm -hmm. this plan, 
specifically number one. Okay, uh, let's yep. talk about workforce. That's also a goal in this plan. Uh, tell us what that focuses on specifically. Sure, we can't do anything that we need to do or that's part of our mission without our workforce. So they are uh, tremendous people, great people. When you think of our retail workers, right, they're on the front lines um, in a very external way, um, helping to provide people with hopefully an elevated, great customer service um, experience. They deserve and need to be compensated in a way that is competitive with today's market. And so I am excited that, that today um, I can announce that this summer, right around the corner, our workers are gonna be receiving a raise and they deserve that raise. And this is gonna help make them more competitive um, you know, with our market comp uh, uh, competitors. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that's not only gonna help us with retention, but it's also gonna help us with our turnover. But look, it's not all about compensation, right, and money. Obviously that's very important, but we know, I know, that to maximize those outcomes, to have better retention or better recruitment and then better retention, we have to do things like career development. So we've had a team of people working to on a career development program to make sure that we're helping identify people that want to move up with our agency and or move up with state government, right? And so we're asking the questions like, what do you aspire to be and do? Uh, let's train you for the job you have, but let's train you for the job that you want as well. So um, that's what that goal covers mm -hmm. and making sure essentially we have a shored up workforce uh, that likes coming to work every day and can deliver for our customers. Yeah, and I would imagine it's very competitive out there because all companies across the board are really having trouble when it comes to getting a uh, workforce on board. You already mentioned the transparency components. Let's go ahead and skip over that for sure. time purposes. And uh, customer service and emphasis on that is another one of the goals. Absolutely. Look, we are leaning into customer service and I think it, you know, it very quickly makes sense for people to immediately think of customer service in our retail environment, right? If you're shopping for a product in one of our stores, but we, we need to provide exemplary elevated customer service to all of our customers. Um, and you know, all of our customers are all Utahns. So whether you drink or not, you're one of our customers. And so we wanna make sure that we're providing the customer service um, that our folks need in prevention education, with law enforcement in terms of safety, um, also in our compliance and licensing division that I mentioned at the top of our mm -hmm. interview as it relates to supporting and licensing our, our small, medium, and large-sized businesses in the hospitality industry. And that leads us right into prioritizing prevention, and that's associated and focused on underage drinking. Yes, and I will tell you, we want to prioritize prevention really in all aspects, all age ranges, right, of the life cycle. We are very proud, as you know, of our Parents Empowered campaign, which is our main campaign and mission to prevent underage drinking. Um, but we also partner with our intergovernmental partners to uh, work on reducing impaired driving, right? Um, uh, and also working to uh, prevent overconsumption in a way that's unhealthy. So we're very proud of that and I'm really passionate about that. Um, I'm a mom. I want my, my, both of my kids to reach the age uh, of, you know, of adulthood and be productive citizens. Mm -hmm. um, and I know to do that, they need to not drink before they're 21. That's really important. And I also want my children to be able to walk down the sidewalk or ride their bike and not be negatively impacted by an impaired driver. So um, we are absolutely committed to our prevention uh, directive. It's really the most important work that we do. Okay, we have uh, one minute left, a uh, couple yeah. things real quick. One, uh, we all heard you say that you serve all Utahns. Uh, someone who's sitting home watching this that doesn't drink may be saying, how so? So what's the answer to that question? One of my favorite things to talk about and answer, just because you don't drink or consume an alcoholic beverage doesn't mean we, we don't serve you. We absolutely do. The revenue that we generate, Glenn, um, goes right back into the community. So as a half a billion, a half a million dollar public enterprise, our total revenue last year was just slightly over $500 million. Of that, a little over $200 million goes right back to the state. That's funding public safety programs, school lunches, transportation, and a whole host of other services that help keep taxes low mm -hmm. for every Utah that lives here. I'm really proud about that, and I really want people to understand that. That's how you're our customer, even if you don't drink or buy alcoholic beverage products. Okay, and I do want to just mention real quick, as we are out of time, that a name change is coming uh, in June to the Department of Alcoholic Beverage Services. 
to reflect more of the mission, not that control is being taken out of that, but a more overall uh, mission for your agency. I uh, really appreciate your time. Very important conversation. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Glenn. Coming up, protesters showing up at the homes of Supreme Court justices and elected officials. Are they going too far? Our panel debates that a little later. But first, the bipartisan effort in the nation's capital to label Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. The details after the break. Welcome back. Republicans are railing against the president's economic performance, but President Biden says their plan is worse. Washington correspondent Hannah Brandt breaking down the back and forth. When it comes to economic concerns, Republicans are pointing fingers at the president. The biggest tax we have right now on Americans is the inflation tax. I mean, it's caused by Joe Biden and there's all this reckless spending. But President Biden says the Republican alternative is extreme. He's taking aim specifically at a plan released by Senator Rick Scott, which calls for all Americans to pay some income tax. Their plan is to raise taxes on 75 million American families, over 95 percent of whom make less than $100,000 a year. But Senator Scott told me that's a lie. Would your tax plan raise taxes on millions of Americans? No, I've never supported raising taxes on, on people. President Biden says Republicans are blaming him because they want frustrated Americans to push them back into the majority in November. That you're going to will hand power over to them and enact so they can enact their extreme agenda. Senator Rick Scott does believe Republicans will take back control of Congress soon and says when they do, his party has a plan for how to fix the economy. You reduce taxes, you reduce fees, you make it easier for people to get in business. That's what you do. You don't do what the Democrats and Joe Biden are doing. In Washington, I'm Hannah Brandt. In the nation's capital, a liberal Democrat and conservative Republican are teaming up. It's all in an effort to officially designate Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. Washington, uh, Washington correspondent Alexander Lamone with that story. Putin is a thug and a bully. Russia is accused of committing war crimes, like intentionally targeting civilians in Ukraine. Now two U.S. senators want to pass a resolution to urge the Secretary of State to designate Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. This designation will matter in U.S. law. There are only four other countries that have such a designation. Senators Richard Blumenthal and Lindsey Graham say Putin's plans are clear. To recreate the Soviet empire of the former Soviet Union as much as he can, unless he is stopped. That's why our own national security is at risk. The senators say Ukraine asked the U.S. to designate Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism and that doing so would show Ukraine it has the full support of the United States. They also say it will set an example for other countries and tell Russia. Change course because if you stay with Putin it's going to be a miserable existence for the Russian people. The senators want their resolution attached to the package that would provide nearly $40 billion in emergency aid to Ukraine. The need is great and time is of the essence. The Biden administration says it won't hesitate to use appropriate tools, but that the State Department must follow proper procedure. They take a look at the law and undergo a review of whether somebody has violated or a country has violated international terrorism laws. In Washington, Alexandra Limon. So to come, the Supreme Court likely to overturn Roe v. Wade. How will it play out from here? Our panel debates after the break.
Time now to dig deeper into some of the big stories of the week with the Inside Utah Politics panel. This week we have State Senator Todd Weiler and former State Representative Rebe uh, Rebecca chavez Hauk. Great to have both of you on the show. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks. Let's start with this new tactic we're seeing from protesters. We've seen it here locally and on a national level, but uh, protesters now taking over neighborhoods where Supreme Court justices live and protesting over the uh, leaked draft of Roe v. Wade. Rebecca, let's start with you. What do you make of this new trend that we're starting to see of them going deep into neighborhoods like this? Well, there's a lot to unpack here, Glenn. I think the first thing we need to remember is that the First Amendment does protect an individual's right to protest peacefully uh, against their government. And so we'll start there. Um, uh, the, the, this new formula of work going into people's neighborhoods and houses. We've also seen that in the past. I know that there have been incidences where in uh, situations of elected officials in particular, you have people will, that will protest in their, by their homes in their neighborhoods. Uh, but the court has been very clear on how that time, place, and manner can occur in terms of protest in these situations. Um, you know, we've had abortion clinics that have been uh, have dealt with protesters for well over two decades and the court has upheld the ability for individuals to protest in that manner. Um, so I think one of the things we have to look at is related to public officials. When people are in the public eye and when people are public officials, there are usually different uh, situations that occur in terms of the protections that they have related to privacy. Um, and maybe Senator Weiler can de dig deep a little bit into that. But those are the things we need to remember, that people do have the right to protest peacefully. Mm -hmm. Senator, your thoughts? Yeah, mm -hmm. so it was wrong when it happened to Angela Dunn during the COVID pandemic. It's wrong now. It's very disappointing to see people stoop to this level. I mean, some of the justices like Brett Kavanaugh have young children and obviously their spouses, um, you know, uh, both genders, uh, you know, don't, don't need to be protested. But I think that the underlying sentiment, like if, if we shout loud enough, they're gonna change their opinion of what the law or what the constitution means. I think it's, it's misguided. And I, I think it's just another step in the erosion of of civility and I'm disappointed with the White House not calling it out more strenuously uh, or even encouraging it at some levels from Jen Psaki but you know the people that are cheering it right now because they don't like the draft opinion on abortion th this is th this door swings both ways and so those uh, there will be protesters on the liberal justices doors next at the next controversy and I, th I think it's really disappointing and, and, and kind of disgusting. Uh, Angela Dunn's neighbors and Governor Herbert's neighbors when it was happening here locally over uh, COVID protocols, uh, they got really frustrated that people were blocking off the neighborhood. So, yeah. Well, uh, and I would add, Glenn, that mm -hmm. I, I am a neighbor of, of, of Dr. Dunn's, and when that did happen, it was dismaying uh, because of what Senator Weiler mentioned about family members being mm -hmm. affected by it. Uh, but it is, a, it is an issue of balance. Uh, and so I if, think, I, could and ask, and I, if th I could ask Rebecca, where do you find that balance yeah. in these situations? Well, and I think it's an issue of, of lifting out the situation. What is the end game? You know, what is the objective of it? And will uh, what is meant to be achieved in terms of perhaps swaying the justices' minds on that? Can that be achieved by this? I would say probably not. There's other tactics that might be more effective. Uh, but, you know, I think that that's the way that we look at mm -hmm. it. Uh, the senator brought up that he believes the president should step in and condemn these actions. Do you, do you agree with that? Again, peaceable protest is protected by the First Amendment. Maybe this is not the best tactic, but I would say that, you know, I think that we need to look at that. Let's dig more into the issue that they're showing up to the justices' homes mm -hmm. for, that uh, draft that was leaked. Uh, senator, do you see these protests and this backlash having any effect on the final outcome that could be out? Uh, in a few months now? I don't think it'll have a final effect, but I think it, it puts these justices and their families in an extreme amount of danger because abortion is one of those issues where you have extremists on both sides. And uh, if somebody tries to um, end the life of one of these justices to, to deadlock the court on a four to four decision now that they see who may be supporting this draft opinion, I think, um, I mean, that, that's why, you know, one of the justices or more have been placed into protective custody and are basically living in hiding now. This is unprecedented and, and, and it's really scary. And, and I just want to say public opinion on issues sways. Pu 
public opinion on, let's say, same-sex marriage has changed dramatically in the last 11 years. And so we don't want a Supreme Court who is just doing what the public wants at that very moment. Because when the courts rule, a lot of times you'll see the public will follow them o over the next years. And you know, if we had gone back in time with the Dred Scott decision with Plessy versus Ferguson, Brown versus Board of Education, uh, the public may not have agreed with the Supreme Court, but no one's going to argue today that those decisions were wrong. Uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on that, Rebecca. Current polling shows a majority of Americans support Roe v. Wade at this time. So mm -hmm. talk about what the senator just brought up there. Well, and I, again, I haven't had a chance to do a deep dive into the draft, but I think the concern is related to precedence and what do we do with precedence? I mean, we just talked about First Amendment rights to protest and that's a precedent. Uh, and how do we defend prior rulings? Um, so anyway, I think that that's the thing that I have the most concern with is the a trajectory that could occur related to the way that the argument is being presented related to protection of privacy, how that ties to the 14th Amendment and due process. Um, and so I think that that's, I think that that is the thing that is most disconcerting about the direction that the justices may be going uh, in the regards to what has been um, seen so far in the draft. Um, you know, I think many of us are looking towards how do we protect uh, women's reproductive health and freedom uh, in this regard going forward. Um, so that, I think that that's where people are really focused on is protecting people in, in the community. I wanted to get your thoughts real quick on whether this will have any impact. Uh, here locally when we talk about Dr. Dunn and the governor, protesters didn't get their way ultimately. Do you see that happening on the national level? Rebecca. Um, you know, I. I am hoping that um, that there will be some uh, vigilance on the part of the of the courts to look at precedents uh, to really consider about this journey, this this uh, the the road that they're thinking of going on with this particular ruling, um, because that is the thing that's most disconcerting to me is what other rights and what other privacy rights might also be swept up in this. Mm -hmm. uh, in the event that they do end up overturning Roe v. Wade, we're going to have patchwork laws basically across the country. Senator, your thoughts on uh, someone not having access to abortion in the state of Utah when they could go to Colorado or Nevada and have that? Yeah, so we had um, you know a patchwork before Roe v. Wade uh, and that uh, the, the advantage to that is is people can vote for or against state legislators based on their views on abortion. And I've heard this draft decision uh, being described as anti-democratic. Well, I if you want to look at d democracy, Roe itself was anti-democratic because it took the vote away from the people and, 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 and by repealing Roe and Casey, which are already partially repealed Roe, is going to restore that. So I, I don't think it's a terrible thing. In Utah, our trigger bill has uh, reasonable um, accommodations for, for, for situations with rape and incest and the health of the mother. And so uh, it's not, you know, even if it's repealed, it won't end all abortions in Utah, but uh, I think it will end some of the ones that, that, that people find most reprehensible. Rep uh, Rebecca, your thoughts on this potential law patchwork throughout the country? Yeah, I think the thing that's most disconcerting is we're talking about health care. And you know, when you have an expectation of health care in one state, you have an expectation of health care in another state. And I think as long as we continue to look at it through that lens, that it is disconcerting that you'll have some states that will have more rigorous restrictions on this access versus others. Um, and you know, th my concern also is, is if the, uh, the federal ruling is more stringent related to not providing those exceptions in cases of rape, insistence, and incest, and health of the mother. What does that foretell for how the states will manage that policy-wise in restricting it locally? Mm -hmm. And we do know a couple of states don't have those exemptions mm -hmm. in place either. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on one other quick issue. Uh, recently, the state of Utah has responded to those redistricting lawsuits. Uh, the legislature also asking for it to be simply dropped. Mm -hmm. Senator, do you believe that that should be the case? Does this lawsuit have merit or should it be dropped? Well, I, I don't think, I think the lawsuit should be dropped and it's not just because I'm in the legislature, but if you read the Utah Constitution, it, um, it, gives, that, it gives that right to the, the legislature and so people that um, have not been able to win their arguments with the legislature or elect candidates who agree with them on redistricting now want to take that power away from the legislature. Um, this district court judge, um, I actually know her, she's fairly new. I, I mean, she, she's not going to vote, I and mean, she's not going to rule against the Utah Constitution. So I think, uh, although the lawsuit has some high-powered attorneys and it's well-drafted, 
ultimately at the end of the day it's saying the legislature shouldn't be able to exercise the power that the Constitution gives the legislature. And so whether this motion to dismiss is granted or whether a later motion is granted, I, I don't think this lawsuit will ultimately be successful. All right, uh, Rebecca, finish this up here. Do yes, you I, I think one thing that we might get clarified mm -hmm. by the courts is whether there is a sole authority by the legislature to be able to redistrict. And we hope that the citizens of Utah will have their day in court, that the plaintiffs will be able to have their day in court to have that determined by the court. All right, we uh, of course will Keep an eye on that to see how that all plays out. Uh, thank, uh, thanks to both of you for being here and providing your insight this morning. Appreciate thanks, it. Glenn. Thanks, Glenn. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more Inside Utah Politics right after the break. We leave you now to look at what's on the radar in the world of politics. The primary election is coming up next month. Mail-in ballots will start to go out the week of June 7th, and election day is Tuesday, June 28th. Thanks so much for making us part of your Sunday morning. We hope to see you again next week as we go inside Utah politics.